Well, so now I've seen how to use the power draw method to compute discrete logarithms. Um, normally when you're an attacker, you have more than just one laptop. And okay, having a big computer, which is faster, you will notice, okay, the clock speed will get a bit better. So you'll have a faster time um, doing all these steps. But what we really, really want is something to use more than one computer or more than one core on your computer. And you want to use this efficiently. So here's again the picture from the explanation of the uh, Floyd cycle finding method or general random walks. Now, if you throw a bunch of computers at it, say we have in T different computers, then, well, this is the first computer which does its walk here, but you might have another computer which starts over here and enters this tiny cycle there, or you have another computer which ends up here and enters this cycle. Uh, you have another computer, ooh, this is a much, much longer walk. So you can get lucky and hit a smaller cycle or a shorter tail. For instance, if you had entered here, you would have gotten lucky and entered the circle faster. You might have gone to something which gives you a shorter cycle. So if you enter into this one, it has a few elements than the one down here, or there's this trivial cycle here, which just has one element. So you can get lucky a bit faster, but when you compute this in detail, this only saves you a factor of the square root of t. So if you're throwing 100 computers at it, you're only getting 10 times as fast. That's not a good return for your 100 computers. I mean, if it's the best you can do, and you really, really want to break this discrete logarithm, by all means, throw your 100 computers at it. But we'll actually see something which gives you a speed up by a factor of about 100. So we're getting a full factor of t, and not just a factor square root of t. So what else could we do? Let's first look at a bigger example, because for the small example, you want computer would be pretty fine. So if instead of doing um, walks and hoping to find a cycle, well, finding a cycle, each cycle has roughly the same size. The cycles typically have something on the square, scale of square root n, well, there's an eight in the denominator rather than a two, but it doesn't save you much. It saves you a factor of two. So what else we can observe is that we are on the way to a cycle already sort of colliding. So if we started here on one walk and we start here on another walk, well, if you have a different, uh, if you have a same point that we find, they will be walking along each other for a while after that. But the problem is we don't have this simultaneously. So, I mean, with the cycle finding, we had one single walk and we kind of getting it massaged into colliding by accepting that we have to do a few extra steps. But say, if, if this path here is much shorter than this path, it's not that always at step nine they're hitting this point. This one might hit at step seven, and this one is at step nine. So seeing that they would be walking together once they meet, well, that's just the feature of this being a deterministic walk. But that's an important thing that von Ausschott and Wiener have observed when they designed a parallel collision search. So when they designed a method to use multiple computers or one computer with parallelism efficiently. So how would you notice that you have merged? And again, we're willing to invest a few extra steps. I mean, we don't have to find the exact point where they met. It is okay to meet and find it out a little bit later. So also, how long later and when should I stop and say, well, I'm not going to find anybody or I'm going to do it at the same time. Let's assume that I'm running a computer attack with some friends in a different continent. Are we going to tell each other, hey, I'm here, I'm here. Um, at every moment, it seems pretty inefficient on a single computer with different cores. Still inefficient, but maybe doable. But if you do this over the internet, certainly not nice. So the idea, um, and that goes back to the vest, is to mark some points. And actually, when you look closely, there are some, part, uh, some points on this map which have gotten bigger bubbles. You see another one here and another one here. It's hard to see the arrows, the directions on this one, um, but some of the bubbles have larger circles. And so we're marking these points, and whenever one of our paths hits such a point, we call these points distinguished points, 
then we stop and report that we've gotten there. And so this, point, uh, this walk might have gone there today, and this one might have come there two weeks ago, but both of those would have reported reaching this point. And so retroactively, we know once we get both reports, we know that both of them must have walked together for quite a while. So that's the idea behind the of an auto, you know, parallel collision search. And now let's look into this in a bit more detail. Well, first another zoom out to see the whole thing. So for instance, um, these two have a chance of colliding. They have no chance of colliding with this guy down here because this is a separate component. Also, this one is a separate component. So your group might split depending on how your step function is chosen. So again, like in the port row method, we're gonna have a step function. The step function, well, splits up our group into these components, into this path, and then we will do our walks and walk along this graph and hope to find the same point that somebody else has visited. So here's an example um, of the green walk, which was at the bottom left corner. So we started here, this was the starting point for the green walk, and then, well, this is the straight path that it took, and then this was the first thick point that it hit. Another example would be, well, if you're starting here, you are already at a thick point. If you're starting here, you would have been hop, 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 all the way till you get here. So, well, this was randomly assigned where these um, distinguished points are sitting, and so you might have more or fewer steps till you get to one. And the idea is that once you reach such a point, you just stop and you report to the server. And I'm sure the server will get you some more to do, so just getting there is not the, the end of the day. So then let's see the happy case again um, of these two walks that, well, they did merge here. We don't find it here, 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 or here. We did find it eventually, namely at that point where both of those um, end up at a distinguished point. So at that point, we actually notice that we have a collision, even though we collided a few steps earlier. So what Parallel Power Draw is doing is we're doing many, many walks, same step functions before, typically we do some, doing the additive walks, and then we're hopping along on these walks and we stop when we hit the distinguished point. Yes, I'm imagining a, uh, an architecture where there is a dedicated server or when we ran a, a big attack like this, we also did like multiple servers and then assigned what gets reported to where, but let's assume for simplicity, there's one server and everybody who is running these walks reports the distinguished points to the server. Now, in the end, well, we want to use our collisions. So we want to make sure that we know um, how we got there. And so the, the default explanation, and you can optimize this if you're actually running it, but the default explanation is, well, do you report where you got to? You have the distinguished point that was like this big black dot that you had merged to, and you report how you got there. So the orange walk two weeks ago reported its AI and BI to get to this point. And then today the blue walk is coming and says, oh, I hit this point. Here is my AI and the BI. And then the server, well, for every new distinguished point that comes in, they, well, sort it kind of, so you want to have it indexed by the distinguished point so that you quickly can notice if you get at the same distinguished point twice. And, well, for each distinguished point, you store the AI and BI you have received. And then, well, now the blue one comes in, has its own AJ and BJ, and then it can solve it with the same equation as I showed you on the previous slide set. So then we get the discrete log. And again, assuming that the difference of the Bs is invertible on one hand. We'll see in the next path, like in the next lecture series, um, how we can avoid having issues there because our, uh, our group order will typically be a prime. Now, distinguished points. The way that I drew it with the game plan, I was just putting uh, bubbles there and said, okay, you are now a big bubble. But that would be very inconvenient. You don't want to have to look at the general map and figure out, hey, is this point distinguished? So what we're doing is we're making it depend on what this point looks like. So it has to be a property of the representation again. Um, we should keep it separate from the thing which we're using to decide which step to do. So if we're taking the x coordinate of w 
to decide on which step we're doing. And there we typically take the lowest order bits. Then for the distinguished point, we would take the top bits. And then let's say we take the top R bits of the separation to be zero to mean that this point is a distinguished point. Doing something like all bits are zero is what makes it very easy to get an estimate of how many distinguished points we have and how long it takes to reach one of those points. If this part is unrelated to, well, other things. So for the elliptic curve, if your prime p, the, the prime field that you're working with, is sufficiently close to power of two so that uh, you typically have the, the top bit, well, it's as often zero as one, then each bit has a 50-50 chance of being set. And so then getting to something which has the top r bits being set, that would require, on average, two to the r steps. And so this is a parameter that you can tune. Similar to in the last lecture, we saw this parameter k for the number of different step directions we're taking. Here we have another parameter, this r, that we can take. And so you have this decision to make about how frequent you want uh, distinguished points to be. So if it's infrequent, that means, well, you're going to do pretty long walks. So you don't have to worry about too much about the storage on the server. You don't have to worry too much about um, notifying it at some point when we set up a, a discrete log computation. We realized that we had put it a little bit too frequent. Uh, I mean, we didn't run it. We, we did the calculation before we actually spent cycles. Um, but it would have been such that uh, we would have flooded the network. So we shouldn't have too much communication. But there's also a downside in having it too infrequent. Remember the orange and the blue walk, uh, walking and then coming together. Well, all of these steps are already after the collision. The collision was here, and orange and blue coming together, and then we had an extra few steps till we actually noticed the collision. Well, we would have gotten the same information here, and both of them would have saved some time. So there is some delay before a collision is recognized, and that's a negative thing. Also, what would be really, really bad if, you, if it hits a cycle and you haven't found a distinguished point. So if your distinguished points are so rare that you can have a whole cycle, so a square root of pi over 8 on average, which doesn't have a single distinguished point, then you might be looping around in the cycle forever and forever and forever. Well, it will not find a distinguished point. It has found a collision, but you're not looking for cycles in this attack. You're looking for distinguished points. So, well, don't make it too infrequent. Now, if you make it too frequent, okay, then one, the bonus, make it more frequent, is that you have shorter walks, but you're needing more storage and communication. I commented already on that. And if it gets too frequent, you're just doing a step or two steps. You will actually not find the same you don't have kind of this, this, this lambda-like picture, these, these two walks coming together. You're just storing each point. And that's exactly where we started with, okay, saying, okay, we don't want to do a baby step giant step attack, which has square root of, L, uh, square root of n storage. We want to do something which has very little storage. Now, if each walk is just length one or two or something very, very short, we're basically storing single elements. Each of those distinguished points would represent just a few in its tail. And so that's also bad. You'd also notice that none of this is saving overall computation. So altogether, we're still needing square root of n steps. However, we can split this up. So if we're having 100 computers, then each of those 100 computers will do some work and then well, after 2 to the r, say, they will hit a distinguished point. So then each of these distinguished points already means we have done 2 to the r work. And then they all come together, and we're looking for collisions among those. And now the set has, well, n divided by 2 to the r as a size. So we're increasing our chance of collisions compared to picking single elements, but we've also paid for those 2 to the r steps. So that is um, also, of course, possible to do more speedups. Um, 
Well, there are uh, some issues and I will comment on this when I go back to elliptic curves. So for elliptic curves, it's very convenient to say, hey, look, we're only taking the x coordinate. So let's make sure that we have something where we identify a point and it's negative. And so we kind of effectively halving the deep order. That works, but you have to watch out a little bit because you could end up in fruitless cycles. Um, if you have other very efficient maps on your, on your on your set, say another map of degree four or something like symmetries on Edwards curve, yeah, you can get another square root of four in there. But each time you're using one of those, um, you have to make sure that you don't mess up the randomness of the block. So in general, these are the generic techniques for power draw, and now we've seen the parallel power draw method. And if you're running it on a specific group, then of course you want to use all the special things that this group can give you.